Hello, everybody. Andy Jacob here with the dot-com magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series. Thank you for tuning in today. We have an amazing show. You know, you watch the show all the time, and you know that one thing we're very fascinated with is data. I mean, when we talk about data, we talk about the intelligent design using data. And then, of course, the way in which data can transfer itself across so many different types of spaces it's really the thing that's driving the entire wave of the future and we've been able to bring a real leader in the space on the show his name of course is mr philip erdos and he's the founder and ceo of bear cognition and he has a great formula a great business concept and when we talk about tech and we talk about problems Philip and his team are able to use data intelligence really to put you in a competitive advantage. And that we love so much on .com. We had to bring Philip on the show. So Philip, welcome to the .com Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. Thank you, Andy. Appreciate it. Look, look forward to being here. Yeah, it's really great to have you. Of course, a lot of people think that data is very complicated. And it is if you're working with the wrong group, the wrong company. But what you do at Bear Cognition is you really make it easy in a simplified type of an approach for the people that hire you and the people that do work with you. But before we give all the secrets away, let's pull the lens back to 30,000 yep. feet. Tell us about Bear, and then we're going to get into it. Okay. Um, we're a data intelligence and solutions company. We're focused on strategy, management, analytics, and specifically intelligence. Um, what that means is that we have a tech stack from a strategy standpoint, management standpoint, we have a tech stack that we can provide you with that say, hey, if you want to manage your own data but don't have the tools to do it, we can help you do that. That can go all the way up from, you know, just here's, here's, the, here's the data lake or data warehouse, or we can build analytics ready tables for you and you can pull all your data and do all your visualization. We can go further than that and do the analytics for you as well. We can use AI, we can use ML. There's lots of different ways we can do this, just standard regressions, et cetera, et cetera, and then build the visualization stuff for you to show you all that. Finally, we can build very specialized intelligence tools that allow you to just specifically for your types of data, look at them, work with them, and come out with better outcomes solely for you. That's it. And so that's, uh, that's really basically what we do, if that makes sense, hopefully. Yeah, you do it all. I mean, you consult with your clients, you really collect necessary data for them. Of course, you're able to curate and analyze the data for your clients. What types of clients reach out to you? What do they say? You know, we've heard about Bear, we want to get involved. Tell us sort of what that company looks like who reaches out to you at this point in time. A lot of times our clients are people who've tried the data journey before and it didn't work either because they hooked up with quote a SaaS business and it didn't uh, there was no customer service involved and it was impossible to use or they just didn't have the technological background to make it work. Um, we call ourselves a SWAS business, if you will, software with the service. And we have a lot of people dedicated to your success. So, you know, we don't let you do the journey on your own. And you've got, it's, it's an interactive process. We're trying to build the answers and the solutions and the tools specifically to you. One of our favorite phrases is that we're not asking you to fit your problems to our technology. We're fitting our technology to your problems. Yeah, I like it. I like it very much. What's the onboarding look like? How long does it take? What type of process is necessary for you to onboard a new client? How long does it take? And who takes the onboarding you know, process from Bear's sort of side? So we have a, very, we have a group of people in our SES group. They're the ones who take you through the process. So we just now onboarded, I don't know, approximately 100 people for a very specific uh, pricing optimization system. It's very complicated. It's involved in, uh, it, it was used in the vertical, supply chain vertical. And we brought them on, handheld them and said, here's how you use it, here's how it goes, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So we bring them personally through the journey. We don't just flip the tech and say, hey, good luck. And that's yeah. one of our biggest advantages, I think, is that we don't let you, we don't leave you on an island. That would be terrible. Yeah, that's a tough place to be, especially when you have all yeah. this data. And like you said, you customize your technology to fit the problem of your clients. It's not the other way around where somebody reaches out to you and then you've got this sort of thing that you've already built and you say, hey, take this because it's already been built. Let's talk about that because th that seems to be a very powerful sort of competitive advantage that Bear has over the competition. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people, you know, a lot of the Silicon Valley people and everything else think it's important to have one specific tech and then just unload it to a thousand different people. We didn't, we found that that didn't work. Um, first, it didn't work from the consumer side. We used to be consumers of technology, not just providers. 
And secondly, there are a lot of advantages to scale that we do anyway, such as we have this product we call a cognitive document and analyzer. Basically, it's OCR tech on steroids. We developed that for a very specific vertical, but because of the technology we have within it now, we can actually deploy it elsewhere and train it very rapidly, and it works really well elsewhere. But if you didn't, if you just said, hey, let's go set up, let's go hook up with some OCR, which is the document stuff, right? It wouldn't work very well. You'd have to train it. You'd have to use it. You'd have to make sure it doesn't screw up, doesn't have all the other hallucination problems and everything else that goes on with these things. And that's a problem. So we would take our own tech and alter it to fit what you're needing and provide you the solutions that way. Yeah, it's very interesting. Let's talk about forward. Let's talk about the future a little bit. I look at you somewhat as a zykus with your background and experience. When we start thinking about data and we start thinking about the future of the way data is being used, where are some open corridors or some opportunities maybe that people aren't really thinking about very much, but I know you and your team are thinking about at this point in time? Sure. Um, I think the biggest one people have talked about, but they're not really delving into is the concept of dark data. Um, which is 65% you know, of all data inside companies is what they consider to be dark data. It's either unusable because it's in formats you can't do anything with, or it's all stuck in paper through file cabinets, or more, most likely it's in someone's head. So we think tapping into that and figuring out how to extract that from the company and really be able to provide them the, the ability to use it is going to be the next big thing. Now, I know AI and these kind of things are saying they can do that already. We've not seen that happen. Uh, we, you know, we think there's a lot of handholding that has to go on to that and a lot of customer service and manual processes, if you will. But once you have it, you yourself as a company have a huge advantage with your proprietary data now being in a format in which you can actually start doing a lot of analytics on it. So that's yeah. a big one. Yeah, our, that's our, a big one. And it makes a lot of sense, Philip. Of course, one thing that you've become known for in your career is strategic planning. And I'm curious when a company reaches out to you to bear and they want to have your solutions help them. How yep. important is this strategic planning piece? Do you help them sort of plan for the future using your data stack as well? How does all that work? Yeah, hundred percent. So we do an assessment with everybody. That's one of our initial things. We sit down and say, what are your pain points? What's hard? We try to do it on the team level. Cause if you do it just from the top down, people start getting freaked out inside the organization and go, oh my God, it's going to cost me my job. I got a problem. Like we have no interest in costing people's jobs. Our interest is actually making their lives easier, making them more productive, making them more valuable to the company. So we will do an assessment of, okay, where's the data? What do they need? What are their pain points? And then we provide them with a solution that looks forward, but we're constantly reminding them, we don't want to look too far out because technology is constantly changing. So the benefit of working with a group like ours is we can plug and play new tech in as it comes in to make your stuff even more valuable to you. If you're on your own and you spend a ton of money on your on your tech stack, you're going to be stuck with that tech stack for a while because the person's not going to want to back it down. They they have pride of ownership. With us, we try to make sure that our stuff is interchangeable and we can go best of class when we need to, or change or change best of class as it comes on board. We don't go for the every shiny new object kind of thing, but we definitely are the ones who are trying to stay in front of a lot of the tech. Yeah, it makes sense. Of course, when we start talking about tech, we start talking about data. We get into some pretty intricate things, but one thing that I always find fascinating when you build a company like Bear is it's about the people. I mean, you have to have great people, great technologists, people that understand how to communicate. How important when you build a company like Bear are the people versus, let's say, the tech stack or the or the data data analytics? They are the important part. The rest of it you can go get. You need to have the great people, and we have great people. And look, there's a lot of great ideas out there. There are not a lot of great companies. And that's all about execution. And execution comes down to the people. So I, you know, I wasn't the one who put together our tech stack. We have some very smart people in the tech group that said, here's what we ought to do, here's what we're gonna do it. And we all went back and forth and we got a tech stack, right? We have some very smart analysts, some data scientists, some salespeople, some customer service with you know, strategic people, et cetera, et cetera. And our senior management team's great. So without all of that, this wouldn't be impossible. It'd be, it'd be, it would be terrible. It wouldn't work. Yeah. How important for your leadership team? Is it to really come from a place where they understand business transformation? In other words, how important to build uh, bear cognition is it that your leadership team really understands from their own personal experience how to build a business? Um, I think, well, I think it's important to understand the growth trajectory and what one needs to do to actually start a business from scratch. 
Um, my team has been with me for a long time. They were in our logistics business before, um, and they were there for quite a while. And we had to actually rebuild that business at one point because in 2008, as you know, or you may remember, all hell broke loose. And so everybody stopped doing everything. And then we had that happen again in 2020 when, when uh, uh, COVID hit. So we've had to rebuild that business twice. And so they're used to it. They know what the ground up part of this thing is. They know what the grind is. They know what the effort, they need the urgency. They understand what to do. Yeah, it, it's awesome. And of course, what you do can be used with marketing agencies, which I love, hospitality, human performance, retail, supply chain, and logistics. I want to focus in on supply chain and logistics just for a moment, because it seems to me like the people in that space that have the best data and the best way to parse it and get information from their data really has a competitive advantage. So how important is what you offer to the supply chain and logistics companies throughout the world? Um, well, we think it's hugely, hugely helpful and very important. I mean, supply chain in the United States is a $700 billion business, hugely fragmented. So that means there's tons of smaller players that don't necessarily have the data analytics or the analytics to actually do what they need to be, what they should be doing. It's just very difficult. It's, it, there's a lots of different siloed pieces of data. How do you put it together? How do you read the documents, et cetera, et cetera, right? And there's some players in it. They're trying to do it, but a lot of those players didn't come from logistics, so they don't speak to speak, right? That's part of the problem. Um, the bigger part of the problem is the shippers themselves don't have a great deal of analytics all the time behind them. I mean, yes, of course, a Walmart does. I mean, it's a group that invented cross docking, for God's sake. Their logistics is, is awesome. Amazon, same way. But the mid size and smaller people really don't have that um, analytics behind it and end up having far bigger cost structures than they need to, as well as just the difficulty of getting stuff moved becomes infinitely more infinitely greater by not having the right information in front of you at the right times. And we saw all that during COVID, right? So the supply chain, the lengthy supply chains become really tricky. And if you don't have the information flows and don't have the analytics, and frankly, don't have the technical capabilities of doing it that way, you're going to miss out. Yeah, 100%. You mentioned earlier, earlier that you remove data silos and of course, eliminate poor yeah. data quality. When we talk about poor data quality, can you give us some idea when, when you get onboarded what percentage of a company's data, if you can even say it, yeah. is really poor data quality? You know, data that really shouldn't even yeah. be data at all, if you can call it that. Um, well, it depends on the bit. Obviously, it depends on the business, right? But anybody who was in our in our history, or at least in our experience, anybody who was using manually ingested data into, let's say, Excel spreadsheets with thousands of rows, we're going to find a lot of problems with it, just because. Putting all that data in, just from a manual standpoint, people get bored, you know, their data, what, what, all the different things. And there's a lot of repetitive data. So we have to clean all that stuff up. The other issue is we're not going to know if something's wrong or not wrong right off the bat when we see it. So if we can ingest enough data that's similar in type, we can then do comparative analysis and say, hey, this, these 10 rows or these 10,000 rows, maybe it is, are incorrect based on the 100,000 rows we're looking at over here do you want us to include them or not? And then we can turn back around and say, actually, statistically speaking, you probably don't even need those 10,000 rows if we have the other 90,000 and we now we think they're right. So there, you've got to have that kind of statistical modeling capabilities in there to figure it out. Uh, but generally speaking, I mean, to suggest what the percent of incorrect data there is, you know, if part of that 65% dark data, I mean, what's that number? It's probably 27 to 30% of that is because it's wrong. It's just crap data. Yeah. Interesting. Of course, it's complex modeling. When somebody reaches out, I'm very yeah. curious, do they know the insights and the intelligence that they want to receive? Or do you sort of tell them what insights and intelligence you can procure for them? So it's kind of both ways. I mean, one, we try to go, we try to, we sit down with them and try to figure out what their pain points are. Like, what's your problem? And the problem may very well be just simply the manual work, right? Okay, that's one thing. But the other problem is I can't get the answers I need. What answers do you need? And a lot of times they don't know exactly what they could do with the data. So when there was a group that we worked with that was looking for some, uh, they were looking for some back and forth regarding uh, an athlete and how the athlete actually performed. And they gave us a ton of data and their belief was that factors A and B were gonna be the important things. Well, we showed them that A and B are relatively important, but actually C and D are more important. And so our guys are naturally intelligent. I mean, sorry, naturally inquisitive and they're intelligent. Oh, yes. And 
you know, they're part of our group called the Data Lab, which are all people that are data scientists, data professionals, et cetera, et cetera. And they're going to start finding things that you didn't think about. So we did this also at the big university when it came to their donors. We came up with a whole bunch of other stuff they had no idea about. That's part of what we do, obviously. And, and, and it's not just, that's why we don't call ourselves a SaaS business. We don't want you just to hook up. We want you, we want you to say, okay, let us work on this stuff with you and we're going to solve a lot of problems for you. Yeah, it makes sense. And of course, data governance is very important these days, yeah. you know, having safe and secure internal standards and policies that really govern how the data is gathered and stored and processed and disposed of. The team that you have working on data governance, how do they yeah. incorporate themselves into the rest of the team to make sure that the, the, the entire process runs smoothly? Well, we have a lot of requirements under SOC 2, Type 2, and under HIPAA, and we, we comply with those, and we have people watch over that stuff. So once you actually have the system set up correctly, and you're, you're not a knucklehead and just to click on any kind of email that comes across, right, some kind of phishing email or otherwise, it's, you can keep it pretty regimented, and you're pretty good at it. But you've always got to stay on your toes because someone's always trying to get in, or they're trying to get into another person's system through your system. That's the bigger threat in our book. You know, we don't, we don't carry a ton of information that people want necessarily by themselves, but we may have clients that people are trying to get to via us. And that's that's the trickier part. And that's the part we really fixate on too. Yeah, I love it. And of course, how important is machine learning at this point in time using AI really to help you solve complex problems? And where do you see that going to enhance the decision-making process in the future? maybe to help you detect unusual patterns or anomalies, or maybe even, you know, taking yeah. a look at data in a much different way than you currently are today. Uh, it's funny you ask that question, because I actually sit on the board, um, the industry board for the D3 Institute at Harvard, which is a um, digital data and design group. And I'm moderating a panel with some of the, some of the Harvard University college, professor, um, college deans about that exact issue. It's like, okay, where's AI going? What are you doing? Kind of thing. And I don't know if everybody understands exactly where AI is going, but we incorporate AI and ML um, where it's necessary or where it's useful. I don't try to AI wash everything, right? Not everything can, can, can be used for that. But there's a lot of ways we use it. And we call, we call, um, we use a lot of stuff. We call it turning BC on BC, right? How are we going to make ourselves better? Um, so obviously, it's an assistive technology. Um, it isn't a technology unto itself to do everything by itself. I know some people disagree with me on that, and some very smart people out there probably tell me I'm wrong. But from our perspective, for just John Q. Public and Jane Q. Public, it's an assistive technology, and we use it as such internally. Now, when you have large, but vast databases, and you can do, let's say, retrieval augmented generation along with regular you know, generative AI, you can find a lot of stuff that you wouldn't be able to find very easily with a human, right? And so as long as you have what they call a human in the loop to go ahead and track this stuff and to watch over it, works, works very well. And it makes life a lot easier in some cases. You just have to know how you're going to use it. Yeah, but the day I will say, um, and I'll go on record with this: the day that no one has to code anything, I think we're a long ways away from. It. Even though there are people like Jensen Wang and stuff like that are out there saying, "Don't study coding, et cetera, et cetera," don't believe it. Well, you heard it right here from Philip Irdos, everybody, and I I love that position. Let's talk about it a little bit. Let's get back to the entrepreneurs. I mean, you you know, you're you're a Harvard guy. You graduated. You you're surrounded. You're on some panels at Harvard. For the younger entrepreneurs watching the show, let's try and give them a little education. So what do you say to the younger entrepreneurs about when they hit a tough time in business, how to keep on pushing, um, how to be an entrepreneur that has passion, but you know they don't keep pushing so much that they lose everything? I mean, is there a point of inflection or reflection where people need to pivot? Let's talk just generally speaking about entrepreneurship. Sure. Um by the way, I'm not just a Harvard guy. I'm also an Oklahoma State guy. And they would be very mad at me if we didn't clarify that. Yes, sir. Uh, and that's just as important in my background as anything else. So, um, you know, I have a couple of rules. I mean, I have a bunch of life rules that I've lived by and I've given and I've talked to people about. But there's a few things, in, in specifically in your question, that we can be answered. One, focus on things you can control, right? You couldn't control, let's say, COVID, right, or the government's response to it. But you can control how you react to it, right? So, Life is 10% of what happens and 90% of how you react. So you have to focus on the things you can control, number one. Number two, you need to visualize your own success. If you don't believe you're going to be successful, right, then you're not going to, you're not going to get there because no one else is going to believe in you either. Three, don't be afraid to fail. Be afraid to quit. That's a big one, right? You're going to screw things up. And if you can visualize your success and not be afraid to fail, you're going to get out there and try stuff and you're going to, you're going to push the envelope and it's going to fail. 
And it happens all the time. And that's why so many businesses go out of, out of um, sorry, so many ideas don't work, but people still continue to work on other stuff. So don't quit, right? And finally, I think the big one that took me a long time to learn is understand what you're not good at, right? And so from an entrepreneurial standpoint, when people come out, and, and I was a victim of this as well, you want to think that you're great at everything, or rather you're going to be better than everybody at everything else. I'm going to do it because I'm an entrepreneur, quote unquote, and I'm going to do it. That's absolute crap. The real entrepreneurs who are really good at it realize what they're really good at, and then they go and get other people who are really good at the other stuff they're not any good at. So in my case, for example, you know, I'm not great at, let's say, the day-to-day -day activity, right, and focusing on day-to-day -day stuff, everything else. I'm much better at vision and strategy and overall thinking in terms of very diverse ways. Look at it. And for a while, I never had the right people around me until I had the logistics business, and I really got those guys going, right? And they're like, okay, great. So now I have really strong day-to-day -day operators um, and it allows me to do the stuff I'm good at. So as a young entrepreneur, figure it out early on what you're not good at. And one way to tell if you don't like to do it at all means you're not going to really do it very well. You might be good at it, but if you don't like it, you're going to, you're, you're going to fail at some point because you're just going to give up on it. Wow. I love it. For someone like you, how important is being able to pick up the phone or send a text or, you know, email someone of authority, someone that you respect to get some feedback. Uh, how important is, you know, even at your level to have mentors or people that you can bounce thing off, things off of? And how do you tell the younger entrepreneurs watching the show that they too should start maybe putting together a team like that to be able to go to for advice yeah. for consultation? Uh, I think it's critical. And I didn't have, I didn't have one early on in my life, right? I didn't have enough of one or, or enough of them early on in my life. I've had a lot of close friends. I had a lot of people that I could rely on for all kinds of things, but I'd never really went to a lot of people about business. Um, and you know, in retrospect, that was probably tough. I mean, I could have done, I could have avoided a lot of the problems. So if you can find them early on, go get them. Right. I'm lucky today that I live with one of the ones I ask all the time, my wife, okay? My wife is a very successful person and I ask her a lot of questions about a lot of different things in a lot of ways they do stuff, et cetera, et cetera. And it's been great. So there is a very, you know, a very good resource right around the corner, right? And when she sees this, she'll probably tell me what I did wrong on it. So we'll see. And I too have a wife just like that. So when she sees this, she'll see that I have agreed with what you've said about our wives. And it's really true. When you have a wife like that, it's really amazing. Before I let you go, I want to get back to Bear just for a little bit longer because I just have a couple more questions for you. How long does it take typically, or maybe there is not a typical answer for a company that comes in before they start seeing some of the tech that you're fitting into their problem? And depending on the problem, it could be overnight. I mean, literally, right? So, you know, if you're if you're saying I'm dealing with marketing and trying to get prescriptive and um, information from marketing standpoint and see how it goes that's going to take a little bit of time right but if you're trying to if you're trying to say hey i can look at this particular single pane of glass and understand how my business is running better and give me some more ideas that can be like that if we can get the stuff hooked up and go so there's differing problems can have diff different speeds of answer i mean there's some very complicated things like this pricing optimization system that we built in supply chain overnight that made their life easier much much easier so and that took us a while to build and it was built to their specifications. That's us matching our tech to their problem and building into it. Um, but it was great and people love it. And it was overnight, they're like, wow. And, it, and you can tell right then and there that it works much better than anything they had. Okay, and before I let you go, there's yep. a young Philip, a young 18, 20 year old Philip out there right now. What would you say to your younger self now that you're a little bit uh, more senior and have a little bit more experience under your belt? This is the Matthew McConaughey question, isn't it? Yes, right, it is. Yeah. Um, so peop, that's sort of the back, back door way of asking what I've changed, if I could, along, along the road. And the answer is absolutely zero. I love where I am. So I think that the trials and tribulations of what I've gone through allow me to actually give people good advice in, in when, they're, when they're younger about, you know, get the right people around you, know what you're not good at, don't be afraid to fail, be afraid to quit. But for me, I had to go through all the ups and downs. And trust me, there's ups and downs when you do this. And not like everything I've ever done worked. And so, uh, you know, you have to go through those things. You have to have the roller coaster of the goods and the bads, understand what the good is. But also, it makes you better at what you do. And I'm here, I think, because of all the stuff I went through.
I love it, Philip. Of course, data can be complicated, but working with Bear makes it easier, easy, and really puts you in the position to to have a competitive advantage. And we're all looking for that. So, Philip, I wanted to thank you so much for sharing some insight, talking to the entrepreneurs watching the show, bringing us inside Bear. And thank you so much for coming on the Dot Com Magazine Entrepreneur Spotlight Series today. Anytime. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank <music> you.